Hello, and thank you for accessing this webinar. I'm Rex Butt, Regional Field Manager and Family Organizer for Let's Grow Kids. And I'm Amanda Biggs, Chittenden Regional Coordinator for Building Bright Futures. These are difficult times with lots of uncertainty, and it does feel like there are more questions and answers right now. While it's good news that Vermont is experiencing success in limiting the spread of COVID-19, we know that every family will have a different threshold for what feels safe and it will be a balancing act for everyone as we reopen our economy. We are offering this presentation in support of parents and caregivers for young children across Vermont. We have polled parents across the state and the questions asked have informed our presentation today. While we can't answer all of your questions with this conversation, we will address the most prominent concerns that parents have expressed. Thank you. Pediatrician Dr. Brina Holmes, Vermont's Maternal and Child Health Director, is with us today to provide an overview of where we are in terms of data and guidance, and to answer questions from guests Lauren Wentz and Keegan Alba. Alba. Uh, Lauren is the president of the Board of Directors of Pine Forest Children's Center and the mother of two children, one six and the other 21 months old. Keegan is the founder of Dad Guild, a nonprofit that provides support for new fathers in the greater Burlington region and the dad of two children, one turning four in June and the other 18 months old. We want our audience to know that your child care program will continue to provide nurturing care and developmental learning, even though some things may look different when you return. Brina will explain what changes you might expect and what things you can do to help to ensure your child's health and safety, as well as that of the program's children, teachers, and family. So, she will also address key questions that you may have about reopening. Rena? Whoops. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time today. I, I want to start by saying that I'm a pediatrician, a general pediatrician. I practiced for a long time. And then uh, I came into this public policy role as a maternal and child health director. But my heart is still in community pediatrics and in trying to uh, do what's best for kids and families uh, in the state of Vermont. So I also wanted to say that these are uh, extraordinary, unprecedented times and that we're all here for, with you and for you in this uh, you know, pandemic with so, so much ahead for all of us in getting our kids what they need. <clears throat> uh, and I love that we have parents today on live, and I also really authentically want to offer that we are here for you for all your questions. And they're coming in um, into batches of different content area that we're going to address today, but I also want to acknowledge that every family has its own approach to uh, decisions about children and that you may have questions not answered today. Uh, the first thing in our work together is that the decision to reopen childcare on June 1st was driven by data and epidemiology. It was not an economic decision. 100% was based on what we know to be true about the way this virus acts and what we're experiencing in Vermont. So not to overload anyone with this slide, but I wanted to drive you toward the health department website. We're super proud of the iterative way we've been able to change and respond to people's needs from the data perspective. What do people want to know about this virus and what should we display on our website daily? So really quickly, there's an, uh, a detailed age distribution of COVID-19 virus uh, detection in Vermont. And to date today, which is uh, May 18th, we have one child under the age of nine who tested positive for COVID-19 and that um, child was not sick. And then we do have a small cohort of 27 in the 10 to 19 age group, but all but one of those children are over 15 years of age. So when you look at the map, know that the counties, this does not mean Chittenden has something different happening. Sometimes the number of positive cases reflects the number of tests. And in Chittenden, we've done lots of testing in long-term care facilities of every single person in every single staff. So some of the numbers are skewed by the test volume. I also want to acknowledge more than ever in my career, I've had to uh, call people back and go back to webinars and other colleagues and say, hey, I told you something yesterday and it's different today. This is a very uh, uh, strange and, and 
unknown virus in some ways. And we also have great resources and people that give us up-to-date information all over the country, including the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And so we change our advice, we change our guidance, and we, if we make a mistake in how we describe something, we go back and we correct it. So it's very humbling but important that you, we acknowledge that we don't know everything. Very quickly, I wanted you to know that pandemics have a plan. I know we've never had one in our country in our lifetime, but there is lots of science behind how you respond to a pandemic. The first phase is you've seen many graphs about it was called slowing the spread. And that was the idea that we had to put uh, different strategies in place to prevent uh, overwhelming of our healthcare system, referred to as a surge. And Vermont did that beautifully. We all the things we put in place led to at our maximum virus. Uh, when we were seeing the most cases, we only had under 20 people on ventilators in the entire state of Vermont. And we currently have one person on a ventilator. So we moved into phase two, which I'll tell you about in a sec. That's why we know we can safely reopen parts of our state, including childcare. There's a third phase that's coming, which is about immune protection, that's vaccination. And then we never want to forget the rebuilding phase because we never want to be here again. So the way we knew we could move into phase two, and this was weeks ago, we really made these decisions back right around the um, first week of May. And as you know, it was announced May 8th that we would be reopening childcare June 1st. So we had not seen an increase in cases for several weeks at the time of the decision to go to phase two. Our hospital never got to crisis level. We are very lucky in Vermont that we have tons of testing capacity and we continue to grow that. And we have a very robust active case monitoring group that's called contact tracing. And we have the staff we need for any kind of outbreaks that may be ahead in Vermont. So we knew we could do that, but we had to remind people of a few things, which one of which is we have to continue to work on our physical distancing, including those facial coverings, which are such a source of conversation. We can never go back to a different world of hand hygiene. And we have to continue to talk about vulnerable populations of Vermonters so that we don't put them at risk. This virus has really brought us to a place of what I call altruism, where we're really being asked to care about each other. And even if we don't have risk based on age or chronic disease, there are those among us who do. And this will be true of our children as well. There are kids with special health conditions that will not be able to travel back about into some of our uh, regular events like childcare, and we need to protect them. We've talked a bit about therapeutics in Vermont, where we have a, a few drugs that um, are appearing to help with this virus, which is super hopeful. And then someday we will be able to determine better who is immune. Right now, the tests for serology and immunity in Vermont or in this country are not reliable or accurate enough to use for individuals. We do have a work group that meets every two weeks to talk about that. So the things that you do in phase two very carefully with data are you increase the size of groups. And we did increase the group size for childcare to 25 for June 1st, but knowing that we'll very likely be increasing group size for all Vermonters on June 1st to 25. That's a super important point. We're not creating separate rules for childcare than from the rest of us. And schools are gonna have to open with some restrictions because it's good for kids. We've, and summer camps are in the same guidance as childcare. We're gonna reopen and already have opened outpatient medicine and elective surgeries and restaurants and bars are coming as well with limitations. And then the phase three, as, as I told you, is a vaccine. I'd love to do a talk with you about this. It's beyond today's talk, but it is the hopeful scientific approach. And we should really be careful to not forget about all the other vaccines in children. I will make one plug here during the time of March and April when we weren't moving about very much. Kids stopped going to well child care and we've seen a massive drop in immunization coverage of um, all ages of Vermont's pediatric patients. So topic for another day. Now, really quickly, I told you there's two big key points to phase two of a pandemic. The first is testing. We're testing, um, we're trying to get to a thousand tests a day. And so because no one's sick in Vermont right now, we're having to test people who are not sick. 
asymptomatic people. And there are pop-up sites, maybe you've heard of them, and they're available for all without a doctor's order. And you sign up online and we can provide the link to you in, um, at the end of the recording. I also just wanted a word on contact tracing, which is a public health approach where a person with a positive test for this virus gets a phone call from a skilled professional in public health who spends time figuring out where that person was in the last few weeks prior to the positive tests determines if the, what of those contacts was low, medium, and high risk for spread of this virus, and then those folks are called as well. And there is uh, an app that we are using now that is super cool that people that have COVID-19 are able to put into the app their symptoms every day and who um, they were in contact with the 14 days before their diagnosis. Okay, and then a word or several words about the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This has received a lot of press. It is super scary to listen to the press about what happened in New York State with a handful of children. I did want to remind people that uh, this is an extremely rare condition. We are fortunate that children that get this uh, set of uh, symptoms that's now a syndrome are doing mostly well with treatment. And that finally this week, we have a case definition so that we can start to track this both across the world, but also in Vermont. We don't have any cases. I, as you know, we don't have very many cases of children with COVID-19, but no one has progressed to any kind of inflammatory syndrome in Vermont. If they do, we now know what has to be checked off as a set of um, symptoms to make the case that we may have a multi-system inflammatory syndrome case in Vermont. We are, it's now a reportable disease where we will tell the CDC and we have infectious disease doctors on a team ready to learn more and more about this. Uh, it is not in Vermont. So last uh, Wednesday, we released revised guidance for health I'm just noticing the picture says April 5th, it was May 13th, but this is the revised guidance for uh, child care programs, summer programs, and after school programs. This is not overnight camp, that guidance is coming and a little bit different. We were able to use the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention guidance, but they were not very specific. And so we adopted our, uh, we took their principles and created more detail for all of you to open child care. And so some of the highlights for parents and what you can expect, this is different than before COVID. And we do have to ask kids if, and their parents, have the kids been exposed or have any symptoms of the virus? And we, we, know, we have those listed out in all of our childcare environments. And whether or not you've been in close contact with someone who has the virus, and has there been a test, are you waiting? And does your child have high risk, um, conditions and that's there's a list from the uh, CDC, but it is significant uh, lung disease at, would be the highest one in children. And we've worked with pediatric colleagues to make sure that kids with mild asthma are free to go to childcare. It's really uh, making sure that the medical team uh, consults with the childcare provider to explain the difference between a child with mild asthma or more moderate. And if your child gets sick while at care, they'll be isolated instantly and go home. This isn't like the old days where we would say, you know, come in a couple hours or Johnny's going to hang out for a little while. That if there's any sign of illness, we, we have kids go home first isolated. And then we're going to be checking kids' temperatures at the door. And anyone over 100.4 can't attend. The other thing that's hard but important, you can't go back to child care until you've been three days without fever. And that is a burden on families and I acknowledge that. So please know that we're in a different world of illness assessment with our children. The definition of COVID-19 has expanded. In the beginning, you recall it was cough, shortness of breath and fever, but now it's sore throat and rash and some kids are experiencing some uh, gastrointestinal distress. So as always, we would want kids home with diarrhea anyway, but we have to be careful to assess for all of this listed on the left side of the slide. 
And then I did want to make sure, as I said earlier, you can attend if you have allergies. I recognize, especially now, kids have runny noses. But we have to have medical folks make that call that, so that it isn't left to the child care provider to have to decide, is this a runny nose from a, uh, an allergy or does this kid have some early signs of a cold or a respiratory condition? And then asthma is going to need special attention because of the distinctions between mild and moderate and severe asthma. Uh, and so we talked about the arrival. There'll be a daily health check for children and the staff will ask you questions as the caregiver. We also have to really think about drop off and pick up. So it's not a, a bunch of kids all at once and a bunch of chaos. So there'll be staggered arrivals and ideally kids would have one parent do the dropping and picking up. And that's wrote mostly for the contact tracing. If there were to be a positive case, in a, um, a kid or an adult, it would be uh, much easier to track down exposure if it was the same person. So some of these are about the child, but some of them are also about protecting the public health response. And then the hand washing will be right at the entrance. The other thing you can expect, uh, well, your child care providers are all going to do a required um, regulation sign that comes from VOSHA, which is our Occupational Safety and Health uh, Organization in Vermont and nationally. Staff have to wear cloth facial coverings. We've talked a lot about the impact of children on children to see their adult caregivers with the facial coverings. And I really look forward to ongoing dialogue about that. I, this is one of the most important measures for preventing the virus spread and Obviously, we're all going to be doing it out in grocery stores and in our uh, moving about as adults, and therefore, the staff need to do it as well. Kids really do read facial cues from our eyes, and I, I uh, encourage us to believe in the uh, adaptability and resilience of children. There'll be tons and tons of cleaning of all spaces based on these guidance, on the guidance. The groups are now going to be 25 individuals. That includes caregivers and staff, not just children alone. Uh, programs may maintain their operation to different, bigger numbers, but groups of no more than groups of 25 will ever be together. So there, has, there can be 100 people in a huge center, but the, the pod of 25 is intact and has to have integrity. You can't cross pollinate. And there won't be sort of groups coming together and doing activities. And outside visitors and volunteers are discouraged. Um, I will tell you that kids that require services for OT, PT, and speech, we are working on the guidance for them entering the care facilities because that's a very important part of child development. And uh, they are not considered visitors in that context. Okay, and then just a few more things. Lots of this is explained deeply in the 13 page guidance, but the staff stays with the group. There's no kind of covering another group anymore, which is uh, difficult for staffing, but important. The hand washing's tricky. Uh, I don't know if you've had this experience in your own homes, but 20 seconds is a long time. You really have to work on that. Uh, kids that rest will be six feet apart and head to toe. We're trying to discourage the use of toys that can't be cleaned, like stuffed animals, but if your child needs specific attachment items, we can work on that together. And there's even more guidance in the arena of smaller children and food. So just a word about children. This is not, uh, the facial coverings in children is not required. The CDC, all they say is definitely not under two and be, do what's feasible over that. So what we've said in Vermont is we think kids want to be given the opportunity to try because they know a lot of kids understand there's something terribly wrong with our world right now. And they know that they want to help prevent the spread of germs. And I do think that in some developmental search circumstances, kids are going to want to be encouraged to try this as well. That being said, I also know that if a kid's going to touch it, have sensory concerns, put it on, take it off, and suck on it. It has no virus protection, and you shouldn't uh, push too hard. And then anyone with a medical reason, not anyone, I'm sorry, children need to be given permission not to if it's impeding their ability to breathe. We've received hundreds of calls about this. So I do want to be clear, you don't wear them when you sleep as a napping child. 
and we certainly uh, were preventing, starting to present some additional interpretation of the guidance about outside and physical activity. There's nothing about it specific in what's happening with the, um, the uh, CDC guidance or even our guidance. We're gonna update it this week, we think, to add something about that because running around and heat and people are very worried about this. So this falls into the category of we're gonna do the best we can and it's really imperfect. Uh, just one more word about pediatric practices. My pediatrician colleagues have been open all the while. I love this slide because it shows how quickly and how nimbly they were able to pivot and say, how do we get these, what can we do on the phone? What can we do with video? What do we still have to do in person? And how can we um, maintain really, really high quality healthcare for children? So I won't go through this specifically, but please know that pediatric uh, well care and visits for other questions is alive and well and we we really want to encourage you to continue to seek care from your pediatrician during this pandemic a couple more things my uh my division we're very proud of help me grow it, it's our uh overarching approach for child development and developmental screening in vermont but it's also a resource hub and a call center at 211 it is um becoming it became very important resource during this pandemic and it we are learning that it, uh, it's a place where people connect, it's a place where physicians get information for families and families themselves can call and get connected to what they need. Just a few more things, lots of resources on the health department website. We've worked very hard to communicate about stress and how to cope during the pandemic as of our mental health colleagues at Department of Mental Health. We're worried about child safety, we're worried about increased isolation and suicide. We're worried about domestic and sexual violence, as I'm sure you all are as well. The health department has a beautiful thing on the chat box. We have a frequently asked questions section that's loaded with information, but if you can't find your answer, you can type in the question to the chat bot. I have no idea how this works, but they try to match it with an answer that exists. And if they don't find an answer, they, they commit to finding it for you. And then I'll end by saying, I know that, first of all, we don't say social distancing anymore. It's so sad implies isolation. It's time for us to start connecting again. We had a rough several months and, and we are, uh, the data is telling us we can get back to some connection, but we have to be six feet apart. That being said, children do not understand this and it's difficult. And this also falls under the category of doing the best we can. And that is the formal portion of the conversation. And now I would welcome, and I'm going to maybe just leave that question mark up and I'm gonna ask Rex to help me with questions from Keegan and Lauren. Great, Lauren, you wanna start us off? Sure, thank you, Brina. Um, I now understand the importance of let's say phasing, control of group sizes, and of course face coverings. But I wonder, given what we've talked about, how all this works in practice. Right, so the, the best thing I've learned so far uh, we had a ton of emergency childcare in March, April, and May for essential workers. So your childcare providers, if they're opening for, if they're opening now for the first time, have colleagues and access to those colleagues who have figured it out in March, April, and May. So I, I know Let's Grow Kids already did a panel where, and it's probably recorded, and but I'd like to keep using them, that incredible group of people as resources for, how did you figure this out? How'd you get your supplies? How'd you, what successes did you have with kids with cloth facial coverings? What didn't work? We've had a ton of questions about adults as well. It's hard for adults to wear the facial coverings and we don't want to uh, relax that because of this, the way this virus spreads. But we also know if people are experiencing anxiety or they have breathing difficulties, they're not gonna be good caregivers for our kids. So just some dialogue the last few days from people who have done it, meditation, frequent breaks, you know, uh, making the mass part of the child development that day in terms of art. So um, as Vermont always does, learn from each other and take the best guidance we have, operationalize it and admit when something isn't working because it's just, we've never been here before and it's, um, we're doing the best we can. 
Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Brina. Um, I worry about my child's social and emotional growth while staying at home without interactions from others outside the household. And I worry about the same when or if uh, she returns to childcare. How do I make the best right. decision for my child? It's, so thank you for that question. It's at the crux of all of our decisions right now. So as we watch the data get better and better in Vermont, we knew that we hadn't even begun to address the impact of that those those weeks and the virus on our kids and our families. So the decision to go back to childcare and reopen was based entirely on data, but it sure did uh, make an impact on all of us that it was time for social connection, developmental opportunities, joy, physical activity, and uh, you know getting kids back to their, some of their routines that brought them a lot of love and joy. So in terms of moving forward, I can't wait to see kids back together and to, to start to grow in their social connections. But that being said, I think families are gonna make their own decisions about uh, what is happening in homes, what's happening in childcare and how they can manage their own anxiety, their own concerns about their child's development. So, you know, we've heard some stories about kids doing really well at home uh, kids that struggle socially, and this is more of school age kids, that they do have less anxiety because they don't have as much to manage interpersonally. And so that, you know, that this is such an individual decision for all of our families, but we as state leaders, we just really wanted to offer it and it's available. But I also know some families are going to make decisions to not utilize the reopening. Brina, this is uh, Lauren again. So what can I do as a parent to help my child care provider feel more safe in this? Are there assurances you would need to know or practices that we need to be doing at home, such as wearing masks or facial coverings around to help normalize that for, for little ones? Yeah, I would definitely, I mean, we, I brought this up with my staff. We have 60 people in our division and I, over half of them have kids under the age of five. We just have a young a lot of young families and folks are having some success with uh, with kids wearing facial coverings and they had a lot of um, good examples for us so that I felt more authentic in bringing that forth as a potential recommendation. Um, so yes, what I think would be best for families, first of all, heed all the guidance as a society, not just as childcare. So model hand hygiene, talk about it when you're doing it because kids need the verbal cue as well as the, the visible, you know, the vision cue definitely cloth facial coverings. I think it's confusing that people wear them on and off. I think it's confusing people pull them down. Certainly recognizing we're all doing the best we can, but it's we need some good modeling. I also, you can't bring sick kids to childcare. And if you haven't felt well yourself and your kids acting a little like they might be on the brink of not feeling well, you have to stay home. And what this has brought up for me is a lot of, you know, we, uh, with our pressures as parents to work, and without good paid leave, <laughs> we often, we brought a lot of infectious disease into our child cares and our schools over the last many, many years. And this is an opportunity to reset that you don't bring a kid who vomited overnight. You don't put, you know, give kid Advil and minimize a, what might've been a fever and get them to the child care. This is a really important practice of asking yourself and your family, are we not feeling well? So today is not a good day. And the staff's going to do the same thing in childcare. They're going to be really authentic about how they feel so that sick people aren't together. And then the health check, you know, really, the, it's the same thing when we pick up takeout and when we're out trying to do small things like grocery store or big things. Just not be frustrated with each other that if, if you have to stagger the drop off and it means you're waiting and there's a little bit of a process at the front door. That, that kind of support that they're doing the best they can. They got to get a temperature check. They have to ask those questions. They got to get kids, you know, transitioned and then move on to the next child. So, and then I think lots of questions. You know, we're producing some materials this week to come out about to, for parents to just say, here's what's going on with some of the stuff I said in the webinar just now. But you probably have many more questions and ask your providers. Your providers can ask us or Let's keep talking and know that we're, we're really figuring it out together. 
Um, what are the recommendations for families to follow prior to and once their children re-enter child care programs? Um, for example, should we mostly or totally self-isolate outside of daycare in order to prevent in increasing risk for the collective daycare group? Oh, that's such a good question. There are some public health principles that we don't talk about it too much because it's complicated, but you could create sort of social groups of some number for your family so that your exposure ha is known mostly if there is a positive case again for the contact tracing. So, but I don't want, uh, I believe that your family, all families should uh, find the people that they're going to start to do the social distancing with, with the facial coverings, and that they're going to sort of move about with in this next phase. And the governor talks about this as a know your people kind of activity where, you know, if you've got a couple, um, folks that you know and like but you've witnessed some behaviors that aren't in line with the recommendations that that puts you at some risk but i don't think the goal of uh increasing your circle by bringing your child back to care is not to to then shut down your other opportunities for social connection the goal is to for if you heard the health commissioner talks a little bit about some people say this is unrealistic but to just have a little notebook of how you move about in a 14 day period so that if you do get the virus, it's a easier trace to look back and say, Monday I went to Hannaford, Wednesday I um, sat at a fire pit with two friends and had a beer, Friday and uh, we brought our child back to care and she's been there each day since, that kind of thing. So this is just iterative. It's, it, the, the idea here is that we're reopening because the data says we can and a lot of us have fear from, you know, we have, we developed behaviors that we're, we have to release now. We can go sit with a cloth facial covering at a fire pit, but I don't think your decision to send your child back to childcare should mean that you've checked that only box and now you're going to stay isolated otherwise. I hope that answers your question. Well, thank you, Brina, Lauren, and Keegan for helping us to address these critical issues. We really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us today. Thank you for checking in, folks. Uh, we, we, to help you gain additional information you may need to make informed decisions, we'll be sharing resources on the screen now so that you can make sure you get your questions answered. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here, and please stay safe and, and well. Maria, can you forward the screen? Fabrina? This might be something that gets edited because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. It, I do want to say, if it's still recording, that this is authentic offer of my email. I, if I can't keep up with the volume, I've been forwarding to, we have public health nurses helping with the small, medium, and large questions about this reopening. And no question is silly. And as we start to see clusters of questions about one particular aspect, we can put it together and we produce frequently asked questions. And so it's very helpful to hear what is unanswered still or where you need some additional support. Whoops. And, <laughs> and Maria, I mean, then Brina, could you go forward? I'm trying, one slide? yeah, this, <laughs> there you works, go. If it cooperates. <laughs> there Thank we go. You. And this, we have, um, yeah, lots and lots of, resources, but for this slide, I think it's nicely pared down. The health guidance is um, a, a link because we change it. We actually have to change a few things already this week, which is okay. Not anything major, but just to get it really right. And then uh, Let's Grow Kids, Building Bright Futures have both maintained really strong web presence about this, as has our Child Development Division at Department for Children and Families. And then I, I really want you to know that Help Me Grow is there for you for any question or resource need. Great. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Yay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>